Hello, good evening and welcome to another edition of the AFT podcast, The Guna Ramble. I'm your host, Jizza, and on this week's show, we'll be discussing... We'll be taking a view on the first half of the season, um, seeing where we are, how we've progressed, um, if we're satisfied with the progress we've made. We'll also be t- discussing the uh, Fia Walker injury, um, which we couldn't discuss last week because it um, it wasn't known how severe his injury was until we'd done, made the podcast. So we'll talk, we'll touch upon that and how, if if at all, it changes our transfer plans. Also, going on the transfer plans, we've got um, transfer rumours of uh, Julian Draxler. Are we going to sign him this month? Will we sign him in the summer? Is forty million just about enough or too much? And also, uh, George's Paul and Tep, the young, uh, it was there forward. Um, uh, sent an Instagram picture yesterday of his um, journey from Paris to London on the Eurostar. Is he coming to Arsenal? Is he doing shopping for the January sales or was he going somewhere else in London? Uh, so we'll be discussing all those. Uh, with us tonight, we've got the regulars. We've got Akil at 10. Akil, how are you doing, sir? Very good. Excited as well. Good man. We've got uh, Callum at Callum JP92. How are you doing, mate? I'm good, thank you. Great stuff. And first time up this year, we've got uh, Leodi. That's Paroli24. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Good man. Good man. Right. So um, let's crack on. Oh, oh before we crack on, uh, also we've got later this evening, we've got the uh, Behind Enemy, line, enemy Lines feature with uh, Chris Nee of uh, the Villa, Villa podcast and the In Bed With Madonna uh, website. So we've got a lot to discuss and get on with. So let's crack on. Um, guys, we, we, this weekend represented the, I think the mirror fixture of the first games of the season. So we've all played each other now. Um, apart from us, we were playing on Monday. Um, I'm going to start with, um, asking you guys how you've seen, how would you review the first half of the season? So I'm going to start with you, Leo. What, how would you sum up the first half of the season? Well, I think, most would agree that the first half of the season really couldn't have gone a whole lot better. I mean, <laughs> finish the first half at the top of the table, there's no better place to be. It would have been nice to have gotten some better results against some of the other uh, you know, top-tier teams, but the way that the fixture schedule played out, it was a little bit congested for us at that time, and we had some other non-league fixtures that also kind of jammed things up with that a little bit more. But, you know, top of the table, can't complain. Good stuff. Okay, Callum, what about you? Yeah, I mean, it's been brilliant. Um, I think you only have to look at last season to see, you know, the, the progress he's made already because um, last year it was by, I don't know, October, November, and, and really by that point we'd given up any hope of challenging for the title. To, to So, um, you know, as Leo says, to be top of the league at the halfway point, you can't really ask for much more than that. I think you look at everywhere from, you know, our Chesney's a better goalkeeper now than he was 12 months ago. Um, the defence looks incredibly solid, the best in the league for my money. Um, the midfield now, we've got an embarrassment of riches with Ertzel coming in and Flamini adding something. Um, and obviously the first half, Giroud had improved as well, although he's dropped off a little bit. So all in all, you know, I don't think you can really um, criticise anyone at the club too much because we've made a hell of a lot of progress. And you look at the last two seasons, we've, we've finished the season very strongly when it's, we've needed to, you know, catch up with someone. Now that we're at the top, we might um, not reacting quite the same way, but yeah, you know, just to be involved in the title race is, is a nice feeling again, um, and to be top of the pile, you know, is a great feeling as well. So it's um, yeah, all in all, I'm, I'm delighted with how the first half of the season went, and I'm just hoping that we can keep it up um, in the coming weeks and hopefully all the way to the end of the season. Good stuff, um, Axe. Yeah, if I mean, the season. If the season was from January to December kind of the year we would have won the league apparently we've collected the most points in the calendar year of 2013 what's your summation for the first half of this season uh well the season isn't from january to december so mm. you can forget mm. that but maybe a qatar <laughs> winter world cup could change it I don't know. <laughs> uh, um yeah i mean it, it, it's the same as the guys really it, it's it's been a good start um you know i think in the summer i think when i thought about this season i just thought i would love to be in the title race you know i'd love to get into the new year still being in it because that's something we haven't done for a few years and it, I, I sort of missed the feeling but i think obviously the signing of Mesut Ozil just lifted 
everyone. The, the emergence of Aaron Ramsey has been brilliant, as the guy said, Giroud, um, Mursaka, uh, etc. have been have been outstanding. I think it would have been nice maybe if there was an improvement to perhaps win a big game or two, you know. I uh, think about the when we went to Old Trafford, um, things like that. Because the reason for that is when we I think February, March, April we go to the big boys, we play, you know, we we play all the sort of big teams, um, in a short space of time. So I think that might have might have helped. But I mean, you know, that that's been quite picky. Um who can argue we're in this title race and hopefully we stay there until May and win it. Stuff, great stuff. Okay. Great. Um I don't think anybody would have predicted us to be as, to be where we are in the in the title chase um, as things stand, especially when you go back to the beginning of the season, which we'll cover later on in the program. Um, but definitely, uh, we, we we certainly seem to be staying the course, and especially with you know having coped with uh, in, uh, injuries, we've had um, uh, Theo who's been out for a while. Um, you know, uh, Kozola, Podolski, Kozola is only just really coming back into form. Um, I was thinking about yeah. this the other day actually and it's funny mm. nearly all of our players have been injured at some point mm. you know it really is quite crazy you think Podolski Arteta at the beginning of the season sure has been out Rams has been out for a little while uh, Chesney hasn't um, but you know we've always had even if some of the players have only been out for a week or two there's mm. always been there really has been um, only maybe four or five players I can think of that haven't actually picked up injuries and quite sure. a lot of them I'd say six or seven or so, I've missed a fair chunk of it. You know, we talk about Oxlade Chamberlain, he's only coming back today, mm-hmm. having not played since the opening day of the season. And, you know, Podolski hadn't played till August, only came back on Boxing Day. Yeah. We've re- and obviously Theo, we missed him, and now we're going to miss him even more. So we've, yeah. we've had some rotten luck. Exactly. I mean, injuries. some, and, and opposition fans might say, oh, they've had the same, you know, same, same trials and tribulations. But, you know, if you look at the top four, the squads, the comparative, the respective squads in all the top four, I think we, we, are, we are the thinnest in terms of depth. Um, so, you know, um, where we, where our key players are injured, it, it probably affects us more, certainly more than it would say Chelsea, the Man City. Well, we can't uh, just afford to have twenty million pound reserve players. I mm. think that's the long and short of it, you know. So they've got like today, there guys like Les got a Milner on the bench who are cost twenty million a pop. Um, Jovetic they bought for 20 million he's barely played this season I know he's been injured but still it's you know unfortunately unless you've got that oil money or whatever you can't really afford to have um, a whole second or third team even of mm-hmm. of highly talented players but you know players that have come in have really excelled you look at Nabry you know if we hadn't had injuries to Walcott and Oxlade Chamberlain earlier this season he would never have got a shot and you know it looks like he's we've, we've really unearthed the gem so you got to, you, we, all the players that have come in, have, uh, in my eyes, have all done a good job of filling in for players who've been out. Exactly, definitely. Okay, so let's move on to the uh, Fear Walker injury and, and what it means to the to our squad and the, the way we play. Um, Axe, how do you, severe do you think this injury is to our title chances? Uh, well, it depends on how Chamberlain and, um, comes back and how Navarre sort of performs. Um, it, it's a massive blow because I think Theo would have got us 20 plus goals in all competitions. So I think it, uh, we have to sort of replace his goals. I mean, he obviously gives us something different, you know, he sort of stretches games, gets in behind, etc., etc. But it's his goals that we will have to replace. And I think it's, it's sort of time for the Ozil, the consolers to maybe, you know, chip in with a few more goals um, so I think it, it will affect us but you know he was out for a few months at the start of the season and we sort of coped so uh, I think it, it's a little bit about squad rotation um, in the next couple of months but mm. you know hopefully hopefully we'll cope but of course it's a massive blow because Dia is a great player mm. uh, Callum going to you um, you know uh, people have said that this is time for Oxley Chamberlain and Sergan Abri to step up but um, what do you think? Do you, do you think that um, uh, Lucas Podolski probably has a greater role to play now that um, you know he's going to be probably apart from Giroud our um, next most potent attacking outlet? Well, yeah, I mean, like, like, like Ackle said, you know, what we're going to miss most is his goals, um, and it's unsafe to say that. But I think both Nabry and Oxley Chamberlain, who are natural right wingers, can play in that position, mm. um, and obviously Wilshire and Kazola, You know, we, we can fill that spot. We're not going to have trouble putting a right winger on the field and a good one at that what we are going to have trouble with is finding a player who scored 20 goals in the season I mean he scored 5-5 five and five when he first, he'd just come back mm-hmm. so you talk about Podolski and yeah I think 
Bitolski is perhaps the only player in the squad you'd say is a better finisher than Theo. Um, and obviously this season we've not had an Aguero or a Suarez banging in 15, 20 goals. We've had Giroud, who is a good player. He gets a lot of stick, but he isn't going to score the kind of goals that these other guys are. So we've had to rely on guys like Theo um, and Podolski now he's back. And, and you would know, like to think Ertzel and Cazorla and obviously Ramsey did a great uh, goal scoring start to the season. So we really need to to find goals from somewhere. You know, you'd hope that Oxford Chamberlain and Abbey coming into that right wing can have an effect. I still think we need another striker who can, who can help another player who can get some goals. But, um, yeah, Podolski, we, we really do need him to start firing because he got a very good haul last season. He showed against West Ham what a good finisher he is if he gets mm. in and around the area. Um, and I just hope that we utilise him on the left wing, really, rather than as a striker because that's where mm. I feel he's most dangerous. Sure. OK, um, Leo, um, what are your thoughts? Do you think that um, we, Theo's injury will affect our transfer plans? Do we have any transfer plans in your opinion? I don't know how much it will actually influence the plans going in. I think we, you know, are going to take the same approach we do most years. If there's a good chance to add, you know, a young talent, we'll take it. I don't think that there was any plans at any point to, you know, make a marquee sign that's going to come in and, you know, walk right into the starting 11. That's not our, you know, that's not Vanger's style. And really, the January transfer window is not a good time to make those kind of signings because you're going to have to really break the bank to bring in a talent like that. And quite frankly, we haven't had the money to do that or at least haven't acted as though we do. And I, I think, you know, the rumors that the players we've been linked to are probably more realistic as the types of players that we would approach in January anyhow with uh, Ntep and uh, Draxler. Um, mm-hmm. Draxler being a little bit high on the uh, in the price range, but, you know, the 21, I think, what is he, 21? Attacking mid, you know, kind of fits the MO of the types of players we like to approach. Um, maybe it kind of puts a little bit more pressure, knowing that uh, Walcott's going to be out for the remainder of the season, you know, to go ahead and get that signing in now. Um but I don't think it's a signing that wouldn't have been made otherwise, if that makes sense. You know, it might have been made in the summer instead of January, but I don't think that it's, you know, going to change the plans because Walcott's going to be back next year. You're not going to sign a player, you know, that's that age, you know, to replace Walcott for four months. You know, that's going to be a player that you're going to add to the squad for the long haul. So we'll see what happens. You know, I'm, I don't think that we're going to, you know, really miss Walk. I mean, it sounds bad saying that. I don't think we're going to miss him that much because we are getting back Podolski and AOC, and they're the types of players that can contribute and score goals, and hopefully it doesn't impact our overall title chance. And I, and I don't think that it will because we've played well without Walcott at times this year. Cool. All right, then, uh, Callum, um, Leo's touched upon the uh, who we might sign. Um, in the January transfer windows, we've seen the rumours, seen the speculation in the papers. Uh, what's your thoughts on the possible signing of someone like a Draxler or another unknown quality quantity like Antep? Well, or anybody else? With, with Draxler, it seems first of all odd that we'd sign a player with, with such a huge price tag in January. Um, and you know, I don't really know if he's a forty million pound player. I haven't seen enough of him really um, to say if he's worth that or not. You'd, you'd like to think, you know, if we are going to spend that kind of money on him, Wenger would, would be pretty confident that he is. But, you know, we've been linked with other players like uh, Griezmann, who, who's at Sociedad. He's, I don't know, 25 million, I think his buyout is. Mm-hmm. I'd much rather us spend that kind of money on him and then that extra 15 million can go towards a new striker. You know, uh, there's been some sort that Drax is going to be, we're going to try and convert him into a striker or, or something on those lines. Or is it like a false number nine? I'm not really too sure that's what we should be doing or if he's able to do that. Um, I mean, I've said, my, my thinking throughout the window has just been, let's get someone. You know, I was saying the other last week that Berbatov, I'd be happy with someone like him. Someone like the Tep, again, you know, he plays in League Two. I, I can't, in, in France, I can't really say an awful lot about him, other than the fact that I don't really know if a young kid from, from League Two is going to have much of a difference in the title race. You know, we've already got one of them. We've got Sonogo. Um, so really, I just want to see us go for someone with, with a bit of pedigree. You know, I understand that a uh, Diego Costa or a or a Martinez might not be possible, but let's just get someone with a little bit of experience who perhaps preferably someone who knows how to play in the Premier League. But, um, yeah, I'd like to see us avoid someone like the Tep, who seems a bit young. 
Mm. Okay, uh, Alex, over to you. Um, you know, as I said, uh, Intep and Drax, there seems to be the, the new daily uh, names on the on, on, on the back pages. Like I mean, before it was it was um, Berbatov and then it was Costa and Martinez and so on and so forth. What do you recommend? I mean, just going, just talking about Intep, he's, if he does come, he'll be like the fourth or fifth player we've signed from Oxford. So we've got some sort of relationship going on there. Would that, do you reckon that would have any influence on, on whether we sign him or not? Um, well, even if we do, I think that that would be one for the future. Cause I think he would, would think we would rather play Sonogo, uh, considering we got him in summer mm-hmm. quite early. Um, in terms of the transfer window, generally, I mean, Draxler, you know, from what I've seen in Europe, has, has always impressed me. And I think he is an awesome Wenger type of player. So mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised to see him perhaps come maybe in January, maybe in the summer. But I mean... Mm-hmm. January signings traditionally Arsene Wenger did like to get big players in January and give them six months to bed in because he always said six you need six months I mean mm-hmm. before Ozil came our record signings our Charvin and Reyes both mm-hmm. came in January Gen- along, yeah. along with Dio and Abayor mm-hmm. so you know we have done business in January so the, the thing mm-hmm. about uh, Wenger not liking to do sort of deals in January I think is a little bit false because I think he has just think over the, over recent years players haven't wanted to lose you know clubs sorry haven't wanted to lose their players in January mm-hmm. um, and that's just because every position now is important with the sort of money involved in the game so mm-hmm. I think I think you know when Arsenal do say when Arsenal make the sort of just say that we're sort of on alert if anything comes along we'll, we'll we'll probably do it so I think it actually is like that I think Arsenal are quite relaxed I think if you know like the end of the season, um, end of the transfer window in, in the summer, if a Messi Ozil type player does become available, I think Arsenal will pounce. But at the moment, I don't think they're actively looking. I think maybe they're waiting for uh, clubs to come to them. Cool, great stuff. All and, right. And I uh, also think I also sorry, I also think yeah. he's going to put a bit of faith in Bender. I, I honestly think Nicholas mm. Bender has got got a part to play this season. I think I think from what what sort of Wenger's like told the press and stuff I think he's quite impressed with his attitude and the way he's come back so I wouldn't be surprised to see him feature more mm, he's definitely coming back with a lot more desire this season definitely um, right so let's uh, talk quickly about um, we've, we've, we've discussed mostly about Arsenal let's just uh, look at to the, uh, the officiating <laughs> that seems to be on everybody's lips uh, recently, especially with today's games and whatnot, do you think that um, I I read on on Twitter somewhere somebody saying that you know big clubs with all the big Arab money and oil money and whatnot getting the rubber to green with the officials? Do you think do you think there's any truth in that, or do you think everything you know we we get our own bits of luck as well, and and it's all sort of like a, a false a falsified like urban myth or acts? Would you reckon? Um, I, I don't know to be honest. Um, you know, I think if you, if you go to any supporter of a football club who, who watches every game of their, you know, of, of the club they support, they'll probably always come up with decisions that other clubs have got and stuff. So I, I don't know. I don't think there's a sort of agenda against it. I just, I think, I think the, the, um, Ciote goal that we're, you know, talking about, that was a goal and that should not have been ruled off sides. It was a very, very bad decision and I can see why sort of Newcastle are, are, are very upset and probably the rest mm-hmm. of the league as well. So, but I think, I think every supporter could probably find decisions against their team. You know, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm sure if we look at sort of Arsenal, we could probably find things that where, where we were lucky. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, I think that's just football, but mm-hmm. the standard of, standard of refereeing, I, I don't think it's great. Um, you know, I think we've got, with sort of technology advancements, um, you know, in every other industry, it seems. I think we could use it more in football, but, you mm. know, hopefully that will come. Cool. All right, Callum, what's your thoughts on... Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult to see when you think back, because you are inevitably going to be looking through Arsenal tinted glasses, but it, it doesn't seem that we get the sort of luck that perhaps City have enjoyed this season. And I'm not trying to suggest there's some kind of concerted campaign to get City to win the league or they don't like Arsenal or anything like that I just think but you know you look back over the, just the last few games you know the the, 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 um, the decision to rule out the goal today was just scandalous mm. you know it was unbelievably bad and it, the referee made the call he could see clearly that um, the, 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 the player Gufran hadn't touched it in an offside position and he was on the other side of the goal to Joe Hart he wasn't obstructing him 
So that was just absolutely awful. And it's funny um, that Akil mentions technology because, you know, we spent, they spent, he spent about a minute going over to talk to the linesman and, and discuss whatever he was discussing with him. He could have spent the same amount of time popping over to a TV screen and clearly seeing that there was nothing wrong with that goal. Mm. And then we don't have this whole, you know, this rubbish. Yeah. Um, but inevitably that's what the, 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 the game was, um, we, what we remembered about this game yeah. and, you know, things boiled over and stuff and it was just, it's just sad, you know, and then you think back to sit, you know, when we played them, they deserved to win the game, but they also had a hell of a lot of decisions got, got, go for them and against us. Um, they beat Liverpool 2 1, didn't deserve to beat them. A number of decisions went against them, so it's frustrating when, you, when you're sitting there and you're watching a team as good as theirs that cost half a billion pounds to make. Um, mm. Just get decisions after decision, you know. I saw a lot of people say, say today that they're the new United. Um, and, you know, I just think that the, the level of officiating really isn't up to scratch. Um, and, and unfortunately, it seems that we're not really um, the ones who get the, the rub of the green most of the time. And I can't mm. think of a like we got whenever we got a dodgy penalty. I think we had one last season because all I dived. But apart from that, mm. it seems we either get a penalty for stone wall and all the 50-50s we don't tend to get. Okay. So it's frustrating, but that's just the way it is, I guess. Uh, Leo, I want to come to you and ask you about... Um you know, uh, you follow American sports. Um, technology is a big part of American sports. Yeah. Is there anything we can learn? What we can learn and take from uh, American sports? We, we, the technology is there, but they don't seem to. Re- apart from the goal decision review, Hawkeye thing, whatever it is, they don't really seem to be taking full advantage. Do you think it's time that football moves ahead, modernizes, and gets in line with the whole technology thing? Yeah, I mean, there's no reason not to. There's you know, just the question of to what degree do you want to have it playing a part in the game. I mean, the Hawkeye type technology for goal lines, I mean, that doesn't, I mean, I see no reason why you shouldn't be doing that. I mean, it's so quick, so easy, and, you know, it wouldn't be intrusive at all. You know, if you want to start going into, you know, instant replay like they have in the NFL or something like that for situations like today or and stuff like that, I mean, that's a whole nother, a whole nother topic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's pros and cons to adding it and not adding it, but um, one thing I will say is, you know, it's probably been forgotten, but there were there was a time where the NFL there was instant replay all the time. I mean, there were you'd have games taken four or five hours because they'd have fifteen twenty plays reviewed. Uh, they re- completely removed instant replay from the game for a few years, and then there was an outcry about the level of officiating dropping, the calls not being as good. And then they did reintroduce the current system where there's two challenges per uh, half, I believe it is. So, you know, you get most of the calls right because the big ones the coaches are going to have reviewed, the ones that aren't as important or, you know, are a little bit more questionable, they'll let go. Um, But all in all, I think it's time that there's something done to help increase the quality of the officiating in the game. I mean, there's no reason not to. Cool. All right. That's great. All right. So um, that's the first half of the show over. Now we will um, move over to the second half of the show. Okay, back for the second half of the show. We are now going into our Behind Enemy Lines feature. And on this week's show, we've got uh, Chris Nee, um, co-host of the Villa Talk Review podcast and also co-editor of In Bed with Maradona. Good evening, Chris. How are you t- today? Hi, uh, yeah, very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. No problem, no problem. Okay, so we might as well start um, with the uh, your review of the season so far. How... How have you seen Villa's um, progress or regression or stagnation even uh, since the first game of the season where you came over to our place and gave us a, gave us a, a rude awakening? It's a bit of a mix of the last two, really. I think regression and stagnation are, are good ways to put it. Concerning overall, um, I worry about whether we can score goals and keep them out, uh, and I worry about our style of play. And, and I think that actually the roots of that were probably in evidence at the Emirates on the first day of the season. It was it was more effective that day than it has been most often since. But I think that that possibly winning that game has has given Paul Lambert reason to believe that it, it might be the way to go. Uh, and I think it's been proven since that it's actually a, struggle, a style we really struggle with. Mm. 
Cool. I know that um, last season uh, he was applauded um, for using a lot of young players, a lot of homegrown talent, um, and it was a sort of, it seemed like a sort of sink or swim sort of thing. If they swam, great. You know, they're, they're going to this season with a year's you know a relegation battle under their belts. Uh, you're saying that you're not sure if there's progression. Do you feel that he should go out? He should have gone out and added a bit more quality to the squad. Was there enough money? Was there enough money available to add a bit more quality to the squad? Because I know you did a lot of cost-cutting last season. Yeah, we, we've been cost-cutting for a number of years and we, we continue to do so. Alex McLeish came in um, and, you know, did what he could with, with a certain amount of money and then defended his tenure on the grounds that he was asked to come in and, and cut costs. So it goes way back to him, to Gerald Julio as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul Lambert was, was kind of brought in with the same remit and seems to have more of a plan. And I still think that he does have more of a plan than, than some of those other guys. But the quality tells eventually. And we've what we've done is spent a reasonable amount of money still, but we've had to spread it across building a whole squad mm-hmm. um, across all positions in a very short amount of time. And that cost-cutting is possibly going to prove very, very damaging, I suspect. Right. Um, do you f- I'm looking at the Premier League table and it's... It's looking a bit shaky at the moment. I mean, mm. you've still got a, 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 another half of the season to go. Um, do you think that you'll be able to pull clear, or do you think that you're 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 in for the long, long, hard second half of the season? I'm hopeful we can survive, but I do think we're in for a battle. I think we're now looking at the, the, the bottom eleven teams are within six points of one another. Yeah, and I think it's arguable that Villa are the one team within that number that are really on the slide at the moment, and. To be honest, looking forward, it's difficult to see where our points are going to come from. Uh, our joint top goal scorer has broken his leg. I think we'll probably come on to Christian Benteke as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and defensively, we really struggle without Ron Vlar, and he does pick up injuries every few weeks, and, and they don't tend to be shorter than a week or so. Sure. Um, so it's, 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 I think we're going to be pulled down into it a little bit. That six point uh, margin is, probably going to be eaten up this week alone uh, so it's going to be, be a very interesting second half of the season and although we don't really quite have the momentum that we had last year I the one thing that keeps me hopeful is that it was during the second half of last season that, that we managed to drag ourselves to safety yeah um, just look at the table half of the teams in the bottom half of the table have actually changed their managers mm. mid-season um, it tends to work you, for those teams as well you look at like Palace yeah. and Sunderland they've all done better since they changed haven't they yeah definitely I'm wondering what's, what's, the, what's the feeling amongst the fan base Chris are you, are you happy to are you content are you, are, we, are you guys ready to allow Paul the time to you know oversee the changes and, and you know if you get caught in, if you get sucked into a relegation battle you know for a second time running are the fan base prepared to give him that time or do you think they'll get at your feet and you know, want to see changes? It's borderline at the moment. I personally think that we're now sort of past the point of the beginning of the end for, for Lambert. He right. is, it, it's really complicated because everybody understands that he has these restrictions that he has to work to in this remit. And he was very popular when he was appointed and he remains popular through much of this season. Um, and I, I actually don't think most Villa fans really hold him personally responsible for the fact that we are probably going to go through another couple of seasons of relegation battles. Um, but at the same time, we, we lost at home to Crystal Palace on Boxing Day. And there is no doubt that during that game, he lost the whole send, which is, while you know the, the supporters don't have the power to, to pull the trigger, it does signal to me that the beginning of the end might be might be past us now because it, it was uh, booing and um, I don't think I've seen and probably won't see again the whole time singing the old uh, you're getting sacked in the morning song at our own manager um, and, and it's really quite difficult to come back from that yeah ok alright uh, I'm going to throw these questions open to the rest of the guys let's start with you Akil yeah, um, I've got a few actually. I mean, I'm just looking at your next few fixtures and they are quite tough, you know. I yep. mean, we come to you tomorrow, then you go to Liverpool, West Brom at home and then Everton away. So 
that 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 is tough. I mean, I can see sort of what you're saying about. Don't know where your next point's going to come from. I mean, that that West Brom game looks quite tasty. But I mean, on on Christian Benteke, I mean, do you maybe think in hindsight? Getting the sort of 25 million perhaps you would have got would have been better for Villa, uh, because surely in the summer now, you're probably not going to get too much if he continues on his current form. No, no we won't get that much. Uh, it, it was obviously a tricky situation last summer. We really wanted to, to keep him or get top dollar for him. And he's had an interesting season to say the least. And um, we probably won't get the same fee for him, but it's, uh, unless there's, there's some kind of guarantee that we would be able to spend that money and replace his wages, um, then it's it's hard to say that we should get rid of a player who we are very reliant upon. Yeah. I mean, I he saved you. His goals pretty much saved you. Last yeah. Year, didn't they? I mean, they were obviously absolutely vital. There's no point in, in kind of denying that. But I personally think that we were less of a one-man team than it appeared last season. And he was reliant himself on, on the good form of a couple of other players who haven't necessarily performed to the same level this season. Um, I think he's played with injuries this season, and I think that that has extended into playing without any confidence whatsoever uh, recently. And, and with Libor Kozak breaking his leg now, we need the real Christian Benzeke. And I really do believe that what we saw last season was the real one. Um, but we need him to show up for the next few months. Otherwise, we might go down. Um, and we're not going to get any money for him either. So um, it's it's in everybody's interest for him to, to find his feet again. Starting on Tuesday, though, I hope. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. I think if he can start at any point in the next week, I'll be a happy man. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, Callum. Yeah, hiya, Chris. Hello. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask, though, you speak about uh, Lambert and potentially losing his job. One of the things I heard, um, I was listening to about Sam Allardyce, was that West Ham didn't want to sack him, not only because he's got a large contract and require a big payoff but because there isn't really anyone out there with the level of experience and, and, and who would want the job do you think the same kind of applies for Villa I mean is there anyone out there that you think you, you could get your hands on someone like Malky Mackay perhaps if Lambert were to lose his job um, and I also wanted to ask you about uh, Fabian Delph because I've heard a few Villa fans say this season that they've been quite impressed with him and that he might even be knocking on the door of the England squad do you, do you think that's something that he could possibly do or um, is it is it easy kind of just standing out a little bit because of how poor the rest of your players have been? He's definitely standing out because he's got uh, a bit of rubbish around him, but he is in, in genuinely decent form. Uh, I don't think he's... He doesn't strike me as an England player. I just I, I don't think that he grabs attention enough. I think he could do with a few goals if that was to be the case. And, and every now and then he just betrays a little bit of immaturity. You know, there'll be a silly tackle and he picks mm. up far too many yellow cards. Um, and he just doesn't have that element that, that we've had in the past with some players. I think the one that jumps to mind to me is Gareth Barry, who really just steps up and mm. way back in his heyday, Gareth Barry could control the game and he would do that and he, he would drag us occasionally from a losing position to a winning one almost single-handedly and Delph really does not have that in the locker. Uh, on Lambert, I should say, as much as the, the fans are kind of starting to make up their minds, there is no prospect of him losing his job. Right. Um, that is partly because uh, Lerner, I suspect, wants to, to believe in a project. Mm-hmm. And it's also a money issue. I think that, that uh, some of the fees paid out for hiring and firing recent managers probably didn't leave them too pleased. Um, I don't think there are too many options out there, um, certainly not around England, that could come in and replace him or would come in and re- replace him now. I don't really think that Malky Mackay is the man for the job, um, even if we were to get rid of Lambert. And I don't know that I particularly trust Randy Lerner and Paul Faulkner, the CEO, to go out and, and make a good hire. I, I think they stumbled on Lambert a little bit and everything else that they've, that they've done in, in the managerial sense has been a mistake and, and showed a total lack of a plan. So mm. if I were there, I would be looking at, at some of the kind of the, the big name players who are starting to cut their teeth in Europe. Um, some of the guys in the Eredivisie are, are pretty interesting and have a little bit of experience of doing what we would need, which is we're not going to suddenly change. If Lambert goes for whatever reason, Villa aren't going to turn into a big spending team and we cannot go back to square one again. So we need someone who comes in knows how to deal with the young players that we've got who, who we've bought and also who are coming through 
uh, that aren't really being used. And there are big name people who, who would kind of have that Solshire effect as well mm-hmm. of just giving everything a boost. And I'm thinking probably not feasible hires, but Philip Koku um, and Marco Van Basten are probably going to demand a ways that we would never get near. But they're the, the, the style I would like to, to maybe have a look at. But the, the manager next season, almost regardless of what happens uh, in yeah. September, is Paul Lambert. I mean, I don't wish to wish to wish ill on you, but if you got relegated, do you think you could entice somebody like a Van Basten? No, I don't, I don't think we'll ever find out whether we have the chance. I think Paul Lambert's here for the for the long okay. haul, at least until long the end haul. of next season. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Do you think um, it sounds like you're, you're you're suffering from a lack of experience in the squad, as well as probably tactical nous from the management? Um, we've in the past. Um, had our own problems with lack of experience in our squads. Um, we sold off quite a few of our crown jewels after the unbeat, the invincible season, and it's taken us some time to sort of, uh, for Wenger to sort of, I don't know, put, sort of, you know, uh, have less faith or put less faith in the, in the youth project and, and surround the squad with a few more experienced players. Do you think um, Lerner and, and uh, was a bit hasty in? In letting go of some of your more experienced staff, um, or do you think he was doing the right thing? Do you think it was just untenable, like, uh, you know, he was, he was incurring too much debt and something had to be done and, you know, this is the, this is the, this is the outcome. It's just part of the process. Yeah, we were in trouble. It, something definitely needed to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, the difficult bit has actually been getting rid of some of the high owners who, who can't be moved on. Mm-hmm. Um, Stephen Ireland thankfully looks to be on his way out but we've got Charles and Dogby are still around uh, Richard Dunn was a difficult one to get rid of James Collins was thankfully a little bit easier to, to sell mm-hmm. um, and it's those players that have been the problem the, the big names who, who've gone in recent years thinking as far back as Barry then James Milner, Ashley Young, Stuart Downey we've got good fees for mm-hmm. um, and it's actually been um, you mentioned the right word really it's been the haste of cutting the, the, the wage bill that's been the problem rather than the fact that, that we needed to do it I think most supporters generally accepted that, mm-hmm. uh, but it's been slashed, and it's been slashed very, very quickly. Um, and I think even if a little money had been spent last January, people would feel a little bit better about things. Mm-hmm. But it was very striking that we were in a lot worse trouble last year than we were than we are right now. Um, and nothing was done to arrest that and we were fortunate that Lambert had the nous to turn it around on the pitch uh, but it did show that, that Lerner is willing to gamble with, with the Premier League future of this club in order to cut the costs and, and that's a balance that makes a lot of fans uneasy How much okay. of the blame do you lay at Martin O'Neill's door because I know he got you <laughs> into Europe but he had been accused by a lot of, of spending a lot of money and he did the same as Sunderland really, it didn't really work out I mean, do you think that he he was a bit ne- negligent in the money he spent, or you are going to really blame him. You'll get my personal opinion here. Ninety-five <laughs> percent uh, of the blame from me is Martin O'Neill's. Really? Um, Randy Lerner has to take responsibility for naively kind of handing over the wallet, um, but O'Neill had a lot of money to spend. If you qualify for the Champions League with that money, that's fine. If you spend that money on good players, that's fine. But he spent it on players who he himself then didn't use or used in the wrong position. And however they were used, they failed to, to, to meet their objective. And we ended up with a squad full of players who weren't being used, were being paid a lot. We spent enormous money on Nigel Rea Coca and Marlon Harewood, Steve Sidwell. Mm. Uh, Happy Bay was on a lot of money as well. Um, and we failed to qualify for the Champions League and we ended up with a, a waste of turnover ratio that had disaster written all over it. So uh, I, I think he has to take a lot of the blame. Mm. Yeah, I'm looking at some of the fees, like you paid £8 million for Cuellar and £6 million for Luke Young. You know, there's a lot of um, youngest, like just a lot of few British players and a lot of money. Yeah, you know, those, those two are a good example. Luke Young was a player that many felt was underused by Martin O'Neill after he spent that money on him. Mm. Um, and Carlos Cuellar, funnily enough, was one that never really got used in his natural position and generally played at right back where we should have been playing Luke Young. So it was little things like that, you know, square mm-hmm. pegs in round holes on yeah. massive wages. And 
yeah, that's that's the basis of, of where we are now, unfortunately. Cool. All right, just before we go to um, uh, Leo, I know, Akil, you've got a dash now. Um, so I before do, you yeah. do, can you give us your predictions for tomorrow's game? Um, I will say 2-0 Arsenal. Um, and I hope for my fantasy football team as it as it was a game and uh Bakary Sandia keeps a clean sheet and maybe gets an assist. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. All right. So we'll see you later, Rex. All right, mate, cheers uh, up the Arsenal. <laughs> good stuff. All right, uh, uh Leo, uh you've got a few questions as well for Chris. Fire away. Well yeah, being from Cleveland myself, I've uh experienced Randy Lerner ownership. Uh, he took over for his father, Al, when he passed in 2002 and proceeded to lead the Cleveland Browns, my beloved NFL franchise, through 10 years of inepti- ineptitude. I think we had one season in that span where we actually had a winning record. Um, I know the ownership dynamics are a little bit different in the NFL with salary caps and and uh, roster limitations and things like that, but do you see Randy Lerner as being an owner that can lead Villa to success at any time, or do you think it's going to require an ownership change before Villa can really establish themselves? I have no doubt that it it, it definitely requires an ownership change. Uh, It's a bone of contention for the supporters because obviously most people would like us to go out and get a super millionaire um, who can buy success. Everybody wants to be in the Champions League and everybody's like really interested in getting loads of money and having great places for the park. And, and of course there's, there's an upside to that. What I would like is almost the promise that we were sold with Randy Lerner. I, I want the ideal that Randy Lerner was supposed to represent, which is, you know, steady, sensible investment with a plan. It's why a lot of people like Lambert is that we do want stability. We do want to build slowly and gradually improve and gradually start getting back, back into Europe. Um, we aren't going to get either. With, with Randy Lerner and I think that last season um, was the, the final straw for anybody who stayed with him through the appointment of Alex McLeish which was, was um, a shocking um, misjudgment of, of how the support would react and also if you believe that, that we were ready to appoint or ask uh, Roberto Martinez to, to take over and then spoke to Steve McLaren and then hired Alex McLeish. There's no consistency between those. You know, he didn't know what he was doing. Well, building upon that, this year, um, Randy sold the Cleveland Browns. Do you think that now that he's only, you know, leading Villa, but that maybe he's going to have a little bit more focus on, you know, the EPL and developing Villa, or do you think that it's going to kind of just be the same old? He's developed a reputation for not going to to Villa games, uh, and he is in England fairly regularly, and we don't see him anymore. Whether that's just to avoid the criticism, I I don't know. But I think that, effectively, Villa are the only club operating in the Premier League with, you know, squad restrictions and a salary cap. So... I think um, <laughs> you should be grateful as a Browns fan, and I'm sure you are, that uh, the NFL doesn't have relegation. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, we would have been out of the league long ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I feel that we're going in that direction. I really do think that... I, I, I'm not too fussed about it. I, I sort of see football through the lens of going to the ground on a Saturday afternoon and, and just enjoying it. I watch loads of non-league, I watch MLS, I watch any old rubbish. So I'm quite happy in the future to go to Villa Park if the worst comes to the worst. I'll be there in August and September, come what may. Mm. Um, but if it doesn't happen this season and nothing changes, it's coming. Next next year, year after that, we will go. A, a, a proper villain. I, I, I can see. All right. Um, let's move on to the game tomorrow. Um, what would you, who would you say, you keep, apart from the obvious of Christian Benzeke, who would you say the key players that Arsenal would have to watch out for? I think Benteke is the only one, really. Um, if if uh, Delph can have one of his better games, then he's the one to keep an eye on. He, he, he's not going to control the midfield in a game like this. He, he can control the midfield against weak opposition. Uh, if he can drag us anywhere near Arsenal's level and keep us on the same playing field, that, that will uh, satisfy me. Uh, and of course, Gabriel Bonlahor is, is one who's, who's stung Arsenal before. 
and yes. he he's in reasonable form. He's in a little bit of goal scoring form. He plays better. He's kind of loved by sixty percent of, of Villa fans and underappreciated by the rest. But he, he's doing well at the moment, and he looks our most dangerous threat. I think. Okay. He caused us trouble at the Emirates, didn't he? At the, uh, yeah. <laughs> he, always, he always seems to cause us. He, he just ran at our defence and it you know, yeah. just split up the Nile. You know, it was um, mm. he's a dangerous player when he's on his on his day, and uh, if he gets a motorcycle, you know, if we can isolate him. It could be a bit of trouble, but you'd like to think we'd do a better job than we did on the opening day anyway. Mm-hmm. I'm just looking at some of the stats here. Um, we haven't lost away to Villa in a league fixture since uh, December 98. Um, game finished 3-2. Um, we were 2 nil up at the break, and then uh, we were Dennis Burkamp breaking in after the interval. Julian Joachim. Do you remember him, Chris? Yes, and uh, Mr. Dion Dublin got a brace as well. Um, yeah, that game so was uh, was skewed by what happened at half-time, though, I think, which was... Uh, Pretty, it, it's it's kind of it's gone down in Villa folklore. There was a, a parachute event, yes. um, and Santa Claus clipped the top of the one of the stands and fell. Um, <laughs> was that in that game? Was it? It yeah, was. Yeah, uh, I, I believe. I don't know if this is a, a myth, but I think that that guy is now married to one of the people, one of the medics who came to his rescue. That day. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Wow, well, cupid, eh? All right, um, good. Um, yeah, so. Uh, and then, so those are your, the, well, those are your two uh, most uh, key players. What do you reckon, what kind of tactics do you expect um, Villa to employ tomorrow night? Over the years against Arsenal, Arsene Wenger has um, criticised various Villa teams for being long ball teams. Mm-hmm. Usually I've railed against that, but you are going to get nothing but long ball. <laughs> tomorrow <laughs> if, if, if you're lucky we might entertain you with a little bit of counter-attacking football uh, but expect Ben Seke to be competing for a lot of headers ok cool 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 ok I'm just reading here that actually uh, even though Ben Seke is misfired he's only got 4 in 15 apparently at this point last season he's only had 5 so yep. and then he went on to get 14 in 19 so you know hope, hope springs eternal for you guys yeah. absolutely and we're going to need him to do that because yep. um We've lost our only other source of firepower in, in, in Kozak, who's come in and done, uh, let's say, very well for a player of limited technical ability, but enormous work ethic. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Good stuff. OK. Um, before we move on to the uh, predictions of the game, uh, Callum, you've got a question. One more question for Chris. Do you want to fire away? Yeah, just one more, Chris. Um, one thing, um, I grew up a Celtic fan. Um, obviously, I'm an Arsenal fan as well, but... Um, one player I always loved when I was growing up was, was Sam Petrov, and of course he went to Villa and had a, a lot of success with you guys. Um, and all I could think last season while I was watching your team play with the amount of youth you had in there was that you really could have done with Stan in the middle there to kind of offer some experience and a calm head. And I mean, I mean, what, to what extent do you really feel that you're missing him still? And uh, is there anyone in the squad at the moment you feel that has kind of filled that gap or I mean are we still quite Delft do you think he's done that or are you or do you, are you still looking for someone like Petrov to come in and, and really marshal that midfield working on the assumption that he wouldn't have uh, been able to move on and I think that his, his age and the time that he'd been at the club probably suggests that we might have just about been able to keep hold of him mm-hmm. uh, he is exactly the kind of player that, that we need we miss him entirely uh, and it's just been such a shock to lose not only you know the player that he was for us, mm. and Petrov is um, underrated as a, a very intelligent, smart, mm. um, and and pretty calculated midfielder. You know, he's mm. no he was no diver, um, but there are some players who know when to uh, accentuate a clip on the back of the heels when they're in a tricky spot, and and um, we don't really have any any players who have the intelligence to know when to take advantage of those situations, who can um, get out of tight spots in possession and just lead the team. And we, we miss him as a leader more than more than a player. Although we, we miss his playing attributes, but it's the leadership that we don't have any of in our team. And we had a couple of years ago one of the very best in the business for it. So it's been a disaster all round. And obviously the uh, the silver lining to that as a football club is the fact that, that you know, Stan, the, the person, um, is continuing to, to win his battle and, and seems to be getting, you know, he, he looks healthier every time I see him outside the stadium. Um, he looks fantastic at his charity game. 
and he just seems to be getting healthier, better, and, and fitter every time um, he, he appears on TV, radio, or I see him in the flesh. So um, that it just completely puts everything, all, all the villa concerns, yeah. into the shade because you know the man's doing doing great. Mm. Yeah, he's a great guy. And his, uh, he had his uh, test, uh, not test, like a tribute match at Celtic Park a few months ago, and uh, yeah, very emotional. He's a he's a top yeah. lad, and it's, it's uh, yeah, it's such a shame. Um, but as you said, you know, the bigger picture, I guess, that he's he's, he's winning great. that battle. So yeah, um, yeah. but I, uh, that was my overriding thought of your season last year was that you could have done with him in the middle. And uh, was it? It was a great touch. That that um, what was his shirt number? Nineteen. 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 You had, a, you had an applause or something. Nineteen minutes, wasn't it? it was yeah. Last year or... That's right. Yeah, it was. It was from uh, from the time he was diagnosed up until the end of last season, mm-hmm. um, and actually at the very beginning of this season, pre-season friendlies as well, and yeah. uh, it would probably still be going and, and getting a little bit weaker now if, if uh, Stan himself hadn't sort of asked for it to be stopped, which I think is the right move. <laughs> yeah, true. Okay, good stuff. All right, so uh, predictions. Let's move on to predictions for the game. So Chris, being our special guest, we'll let you go first and ask you to predict the full score line and the first goal score. Well, um, I'm ashamed to say that I can't see anything but an Arsenal win which is, is not my way of doing things, but I think that I'm going to have to balance that by saying I think we'll get a goal. So let's say that uh, Gabby Agbon Lahore for the first goal, but uh, I can't see much better than a 3-1 win for Arsenal. Okie dokie. Great stuff. All right, uh, Chris, you've been an excellent guest. Um, it's been a great pleasure having you on. Very in, very insightful, very uh, intelligent opinion. Um, and um, all the best for the rest of the season after 10 o'clock on Monday night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> will you be going to the game? Or will you be uh, yeah, I will be. I'll go to all the home games, yeah. Great stuff. All right, so uh, take care, Chris, and all the best for the rest of the season. And you, yeah, thank best you. Best of luck with Lerner. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Cheers, Chris. Great stuff. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right, so that was the Behind Enemy Lines. Okay, so back for the final part of the show where we discuss the uh, forthcoming game. Um, tomorrow's game, we've got to, uh, we'll, we'll be hoping to seek revenge against uh, uh, Aston Villa over at Villa Park. Um, so it's, it's, I keep on alluding to it throughout the season. What a, what a, what a, is it five, six, seven months, five, six months we've had um, since that, that, that apocalyptic day. Um, do you guys, uh, Callum, how do you see tomorrow's game going? Do you think um, we will we'll be, um, you know, champion at the bit? When considering today's or this weekend's results, um, do you see? Do you think we'll we'll go out there and 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 play freely, or do you think we'll play with a bit under a bit of pressure? Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say I absolutely hate it when we play on a Monday night because it's mm. awful watching all the other teams, and especially when everyone else wins. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's going to be a you know, nervy wait for the game I don't think we'll, we'll necessarily take much the fact that everyone else has won won't bother the team you know we're used to playing under pressure or we've ground out wins for the best part of 7-8 months under pressure so I, I don't fear about that um, from a completely objective point of view I can't really see anything else other than an Arsenal win I mean Villa, Villa's last game was at home to Sheffield United and they lost that um, pretty objectively really so you know, you you think the way we're playing, the way we recovered from that little run we had in December. You know, we've beaten West Ham and Newcastle and and, and uh, Cardiff as well as the Spuds. You know, we've only conceded one goal in those four games. Um, <laughs> but you know, so it all looks like we're looking good. And and obviously with Giroud coming back, potentially Oxay Chamberlain uh, so should start. We're looking really good on paper. And um, my prediction, ignoring all the little worries I have, would be four 0 I think if you get the first goal, they'll crumble and we'll, we'll better put a few past them. And we're due a big win, you know. Um, mm. City seem to do it every other week. Um, and for me, I think the only, one, only time we've won by three goals this season is, is the Norwich game, is it? Um, a lot of two nils, yeah. three ones yeah. kind of thing, that's fine. But um, but yeah, you know, but you do worry, you know, Benteke scored that brace against us on the opening day and has only scored mm. two since. And you do worry that he could have, he might just and, like playing against Arsenal. Yeah, you so, see, yeah, it's got two free games against I uh, know, so you do worry, Is you know, mm. is it? And because it's the Monday night, because everyone else has won, mm. it makes everything a bit more nervy. But um, no, I think with the way we're playing, with the, with the, with the players we've got coming back, I think we'll, we should beat them. And um, you know, every time this season we've had these kind of little games where I'm not a bit sure, not too sure about 
we've normally ground out a win like we did at St James's Park a couple of weeks ago. So um, yeah, I, I went for it at a bowl four nil with Giroud to score a brace. I've said so. That's my my prediction. Cool. All right, um, e- uh, Leo. Um, do you think do you do you worry that um, Villa might turn you know, like come turn up tomorrow? Um, considering the you know they need to the the the, the importance they need three points just as much as we do, or do you think that we should um, go there with our professional hats on and and um, get the victory that we require? Well, I think you know the result at the beginning of the year is going to kind of play in favor of both of us. I believe Villa is going to have a little bit of confidence coming into the game, knowing that they've been able to get a result against us at our home, albeit you know at the beginning of the season quite a long time ago. And then on the flip side of that, we're going to be going into the game knowing that hey, we can't come out here with the handbrake on, as Vanger would say. We need to really bring it to them because you know we've drop points to them already this year. So I think I think we'll go out there with our serious hats on and we'll get the job done. I think also coming off of a uh, help us, you know, not having played since uh, the uh, FA Cup match against that team up the road. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm with Callum. I think we're due a big win. And I think that, you know, having some fresh legs coming back into the squad, uh, hopefully Oxley had been able to establish himself. It'd be nice to see him come back, you know, all guns blazing. Uh, whether or not he starts is, you know, to be determined, but I'd like to really see him, you know, it'd be nice to see him play well so that we know we've got him for the rest of the year in Walcott's absence. Um, my score line, I'm going to go with uh, a, a confident 3-0. I think once we get the, the second goal, we'll kind of, you know. Put the hat right back on. Yeah, but they have a better way of saying it. <laughs> we'll let it coast. Coast at home, and then you know maybe just get another one later on in the game. But I'd like to see us come in, get a goal within the first ten, fifteen minutes. You know, we haven't we we had a good habit of doing that earlier in the year. Um, I think it's been a while since we've really come out and got at a team right away, and it'd be nice to see that back, that that mm. extra little bit of fire out of the gate. Um but yeah, I'm going to go with Giroud as my first goal scorer. I want to see him get back in the goal scoring form. He's been kind of, you know, before the injury and everything, he's kind of mm. had a bit of a rough patch there for a bit, and it'd be nice to see him get back in the goal scoring form. He scored against else. Newcastle, didn't he? So you'd like to think that's the yeah. uh, he ended the drought. Um, yeah. and, and sorry, you speak about the urgency, Leo. I think the one player who can really, uh, who really gives us that drive at the start of a game is Serge Nabry. You know, right. I think our tendency when we play Santi or Wilshire or Rizitsky or Urso, you know, they all seem to be very, you know, let's just pass it around a bit. Let's get settle into the game where Serge is like, you know, a, a bulldog let off a leash. You know, he wants to just run at defence. He wants to, you know, he's excited. He's quick. Um, and I think given his performance against Tottenham, um, it would be a real shame to leave him out. And especially now that Walcott's um, out for the season, um, mm-hmm. I think Nabry I mean, should... Play, like- Exactly, and he doesn't see. And the thing with that's impressed me about Nabry so far is that he doesn't seem phased by the fact that he's an 18-year-old kid playing for the a, a title challenge. You know, he, he plays like um, he knows what he's doing. And every game this season he's played, he's impressed me. Um, whether it be the, the Swansea game where he scored the, the opening goal, or um, last weekend where he was just electric. So um, I really hope Wenger give, puts faith in Nabry and, and starts him because I think he has a tendency to prefer Wilshire or or Cazorla on the wing, as opposed to Nabry, which I think I understand, but at the same time, I think we should we should throw a bit of caution to the wind and, and give Nabry a go. Um, and also, I, I wouldn't even be that upset to see Ertz or not start. Um, I think Podolski is due a start on the left, because um, I know he, he came on against West Ham, scored the goal in that position, then played up front versus Cardiff, and wasn't really, didn't really impress, did he? So I would hope for a Giroud uh, back in the starting lineup up front with... Podolski on the left, Nabry on the right, and um, I honestly think Cazorla should be given a chance in the middle. Mm. You know, Urza, we often talk about not being used to playing full seasons without a winter break. Without, so this is a game I think we can afford to rest in, because Villa aren't the best team, and you know we're putting Santi Cazorla in the middle of the park. You know, we're not playing some, we're not playing Icefeld or someone like that, some kid. So, and Cazorla was brilliant against West Ham in that position he was as well. Purring, wasn't he? And he, he was scored against Tottenham recently. Exactly. So yeah. I think we should say, you know, Meza, we we always bring you on if we need you, but. Really, right. Santi's playing well, Podolski's due a start, Nabry's playing well. That's the three I think we should go with. Mm, definitely. I'm just looking at some of the stats as provided by uh, at StatGuna from uh, 
squawk of football. Um, we, between Udzil, Ramsey and Kasula, they've created 42.1% of Arsenal's chances. Obviously, you've got to take a Ramsey out of the equation because I don't think he'll come back for... He won't be rushed back, I don't think. He won't be rushed back for tomorrow's game. But, um, you know, uh, Bentner, if he comes on, he's, 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 he's scored 40% of his chances. So two in every five <laughs> chances he's, he's got, he's scored. You know, um, well, to be know, fair, the two, the two goals he's had, he couldn't really have missed. I mean, the header against Cardiff was quite good at, um, against, uh, Hull, sorry, was quite good. Mm. But, um, he would have been pretty upset if he'd missed that one against Hull, and, uh, against I Cardiff. I think, uh, yeah. I think Gervinho would have a word with you about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very no, true. No. Very true. Very true. I mean, you know, um, so we, we're going into the, the, the game in good spirits. Uh, I, I think Rosiski's signed or is going to sign a new deal I think basically Wenger, Wenger said that he will stay and he mm. said that he expects to stay so I think mm. it's all but uh, a bit like Wenger's contract really we know it's going to be signed it's just mm. um, it's just yeah. when but the, the, the worrying thing is Sanya isn't it that still doesn't look Being very close no, yeah. I mean you've, 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 you, you, you touched on Cazorla who I think is now purring after Saturday's game Saturday's when he was absolutely I mean you could have picked any number of five or six players that were excellent but I thought he was really good mm. as well as the game before I mean that little layoff that he's had that, 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 you know being put yeah. in for a couple of games I think that's done him a world of good mm. I think you know, people also have some unrealistic expectations. You know, some people uh, yeah. I was reading today were saying we could, have, you know, be like Drax though, or we could maybe he we can re- replace, use him to replace Kazola. And you know, he well, was our player of the year last season. Exactly. Um, people have short memories. They do, and it really does boggle my mind. And I, you know, yeah. I've always said this about Carl Jenkinson. You know, he had a couple of bad games, and suddenly he's not good enough. And mm. After a string of very impressive performances, exactly. I know, but you can kind of understand it because he plays so infrequently. But with Kazola. Mm. You know, he was outstanding last season. And the thing is, he's had some games where he's been anonymous, but often when he doesn't play that well, it's games that the whole midfield doesn't play particularly well and none of our flair players really step up. Mm. Um, and, you know, he, he's been injured for a while. He's no longer the man, you know, it used to be give it, give the ball to Santi and he'd make something happen. But obviously now we've got uh, so and, and Ramsey's playing so much better. We've got more options, really. So the mm. creative load has been shared amongst, mm. I mean, it's, it's, it's superb. Um, mm. But inevitably, that's taking something something away from Santi a little bit. And mm. some people say that the left is his best position. And uh, I'm still a bit. I think he's probably the the best player we have for that position. Um, but I still much prefer him in the middle. And um, I think, given how well he was, how good he was against West Ham, which for me was the best performance he gave all season. Mm. Um, and the, and the, the quality of the goal against Tottenham we spoke about last week, what was just quality. Um, I think he deserves to start, give a chance in the middle, and really. Any chance where we can rest her, so we should do it, I think. We don't want to burn him out, and when Santley's playing well, we shouldn't, I don't think we should really pu- push him out on the left, especially when Podolsi's just come back and we want to give him minutes, so. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I love Santley. I, I find it, yeah. I find it hard how people say, oh yeah, we can move him on. It, you know, he's, he's, a, he's, I think he's just short of being a world class player, but you know, he's one of the best players the, in the squad, and mm. um, he'll, he'll, he'll have a good second half of the season, I have no doubt. Good. All right, um, ca- um uh, sorry, uh, Leo, um, um, I was on, I looked on Twitter today and somebody, some Man United fan said, you know, Yanisai is the new Georgie Best, you know, <laughs> he's like Georgie Best reincarnated. And, and it's, it's, it always makes me laugh how, you know, people accuse us of talking up our players, but we never talk them up in those kind of echelons, you know what I mean? You know, a guy has two or three, four couple of good, uh, good games against Swansea and, and Sunderland and he's been, he's been compared to one of the best players that ever graced the, the English game. I asked the question, if, if if Yanazai is, is is the reincarnation of best, um, I asked him to, what would you call <laughs> Nabri? And I think I, I I mean I think we've got more, we, our feet are more f- firmly planted on the ground. I got you know uh, he's, he, you could say he's a, the new Rocky Rocas or, or, sure. or Robert Perez. You know you know people were joking it was all very tongue in cheek, but I think you know Man United seem to be very you know. Uh, they, they, I think they're a bit hyperbolistic with mm. the way they've hyped up this guy. I mean, don't get me wrong, like Yanisai, uh, you know, he's, he's done well. You always but, look um, good playing next to Tom Cleverley, though, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's yeah. be honest, like, I think it really is just the fact that Nabry hasn't got many minutes because our midfield is brilliant. Mm. And United have been right. shit this season, so they're relying on an 18 year old kid. And mm. normal, you know, the United sides have gone by, you'd have seen him play perhaps as much as Nabry has. Yeah, you know, he's a great yeah. player. But um, yeah, so he's got he plays with intelligence. He's big, he's strong. He's very diligent. You know, yeah. he's the shining light in that side, but it's not difficult at the moment. 
to be no. that shining light, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, he the thing is, he's a good player. He shouldn't be shouldn't be saying he's always oh, he's average because he's not. He's clearly a very talented young man. But I tell you, you're talking about Yanis, not, not. Oh yeah, like, no, Nab- yeah. Nabry, uh, Nabry's the dog bollocks. And he's yeah. Club. But, uh, <laughs> you know, let's let's you know. But the thing is, as you said, we're we're keeping our feet on the ground because mm. he's only played three, four matches, and we yeah. we a lot of you know we hype up guys like him and Zelalem, but we're not you know he's not. The thing is, we don't have to throw him in because. I mean, it's funny though. A few years ago, we were, we were throwing Jack in when he was 18 year old, weren't we? Because mm-hmm. we we needed him and he was brilliant. But um, you know, you look at him now and he can't get into the team often because yeah. the, the midfield's so good. So, you, you know, you put him in United teams of, of sides gone by, he won't he won't be, he wouldn't be spoke about in such a river. Yeah, river, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah. He wouldn't yeah. even yeah. seen the pitch. He exactly. Even been dressed. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so um, we've all given our predictions, haven't we? You haven't given yours. I haven't given mine, um, exactly. And I'm going for a two I'm not going two nil, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with Axe. I'm gonna go with a two nil Arsenal win and looking at another stat, we've got um we've got Giroud who scored eight goals, which is as many as Benteke, Agbonho and Wyman combined. So I'm gonna go with Giroud as our first goal scorer. I think everyone wants to see Giroud get back to scoring mm. days, don't they? And Absolutely. Because he gets so, <laughs> we speak about this a lot, but the amount of stick he gets, um, you know, it's funny, like, people talk about Alvaro and Agredo, how amazing he's been. I think he scored his ninth league goal this season, you know. Mm. Giroud has eight. Mm. You no, know, I know, that I'm not saying, Agredo is, uh, I think, is probably took superior. A month off. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and Agredo is a superior <laughs> player, and, um, but, you know, Giroud really isn't as bad as people say, and he plays oh. a huge part in, in this team. And um, really, I just you know at least when he scores a couple of goals, you can you can say to people who doubt him, you know, you can't argue with that. Yeah. You know? And yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm sure he'll get back to he will score. He'll, I think he'll have another run of form like he did at the beginning of the season. Yeah. And event, I think I think after a while, you know, you just get a bit burnt out physically and mentally, and you know, it takes a lot of lot lot out of you when because you, Giroud's game is very um, a lot of it's off the ball. You know, having to fight mm. off defenders and yeah. find those little pockets, and it you know it yeah. can get a bit draining after a while. And I think. Um, Hopefully the rest has done him good, and you know, obviously he broke his duck against uh, Newcastle um, Way duck, before yeah. it just after Christmas. So yeah, yeah. fingers crossed it will be um, a mini resurgence for him. Yeah, more more to come from him definitely. Okay, cool. All right, so um, that's about wraps it up for this week. Um, oh, for tonight we'll be back tomorrow uh, to do a short uh, post match review. Mm-hmm. Um, straight after the game so so that's Monday night we'll be doing a short uh, post-match review uh, of the game um, so yes um, so thanks for coming on guys um, and we'll see you all again tomorrow and that has been the Guna Ramble a Arsenal Fan TV podcast uh, oh, what's wrong with you? Uh, it's either this show or indigestion I hope it's indigestion why? It'll get better in a little while.